Well, good morning, Mendonoma Coast. I'm Leanne Lindsay, your host today on Peggy's Place. We have a wonderful show com- coming up where actually I'm going to be stepping back as host and George Callis is going to be joining us to talk with Wendy Van Dyke of the wine shop that's coming up in just a moment. We have a few announcements to make first and welcome back, George, to kgu Peggy's Place. And... Uh, I'll show you just real quick here. We've got a nice image of that. We are on YouTube Live as well. So if you'd like to listen to us, we're on 88.3 FM, streaming around the world at kgua.org. And we are on live YouTube right now. Just Google KGUA on YouTube and you'll get right to us. For announcements, it's a big weekend coming up. We've got the Studio Discovery Tour that starts this weekend. It's a wonderful event event all up and down the Sonoma and Mendocino coast. And that goes from about the Sea Ranch up to Point Arena. And you can get your your big map here of the 29th annual Studio Discovery Tour at the Discovery Gallery. And as you can see, if you're watching on YouTube, there's quite a few uh, points along the coast where there will be artist studios that you will be able to go to and see some beautiful artwork from Walt Rush to Jenny Henderson to Ling Yen Jones to so many other wonderful artists. It's a big art weekend, as a matter of fact, and uh, closing up this weekend up at the Coast Highway Art Collective is the exhibit by Phil Clark and Emma Hurley. That's Woodwork, Ceramics, and Clothing. And that's right there on Main Street. And they are open from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. Thursday through Sunday. And then we also have the Farmer's Markets. That's going to be up in Point Arena on Friday, 3 to 6 p.m. And then in Wallala, 9.30 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. on Sunday. And there's also Goodbye Clothes up in Point Arena this weekend. And we have coming up in a couple of weeks. As a matter of fact, the Studio Discovery Tour continues for two weekends. And also coming up on Saturday, September the 4th, it's the Flynn Creek Circus. And they present Fairy Tale. Now, this is for adults only over 21 years old and it starts at 4 p.m. up at the Redwood Coast Recreation Center on Ocean Ridge here in Wallala and they were just in Snowmass Village, Colorado where my sister lives and I've been to see Flynn Creek uh, several times up in Mendocino and Fort Bragg. They're really a sight to see and of course we've got our own thespians right here in the sea ranch that's going to be coming up September 16th through the 19th as well as the 23rd through the 26th. This is free admission but the seating is limited so reservations are necessary. So go to cranchthesbians.com or call 785-2548 for more information, that's going to be at the Nip Stingle Barn, which we call the White Barn on the Sea Ranch. And it's going to be a fun thing to watch other desert cities, other desert cities. And that is directed by Katie Atherton. In fact, that was uh, George's first guest that they had he had on as guest host here at Peggy's Place. And good morning, George. Welcome back. Let's see if your mic is on. Yeah, thank you, Leanne. (laughs) Thank you, Leanne. Well, welcome to Peggy's Place. Uh, I'm George Callis, and today we've got a a special guest, Wendy Van Dyke from the wine shop at 1000 Annapolis Road. Uh, Wendy, I'll ask you to unmute your mic, I noticed right there. And And uh, we're going to say goodbye to you both and have a great show. Thanks, Leanne. I'll be in the back. (laughs) Thanks, Leanne. Um, Good morning, Wendy. How are you doing? Good, good. Um, We're going to talk a little bit about wines and particularly wines in your shop and your approach to wines and so forth. Um, A lot of people probably know you, Wendy, but for some of our listeners who are unfamiliar with your shop or don't know you, I'd like to start with a little bit of your background. Um, I understand that you uh, grew up in Montana and eventually made your way to the Bay Area. Take us back to Montana for a little bit there. 
Well, I grew up in Missoula, Montana, which is a wonderful little, which was a wonderful little town to grow up in, nestled in the mountains. And there I was lucky enough to have a fantastic ballet and piano teacher um, with whom I studied for many, many years. And, uh, and she also had some ties with the San Francisco Ballet. So those years were spent uh, studying ballet and piano very, very seriously, and eventually coming to San Francisco for the summers to study at the San Francisco Ballet School. You studied piano and ballet, both. Uh, same teacher. Yes, same, same teacher. She was the wife of... Um, one of the professors at the University of Montana. The University of Montana is known for its music school and forestry, of course. Um, and uh, she was very, very talented and, and also like a second mother to me. And so she brought me down to San Francisco. Actually, I was, uh, she invited the director of the San Francisco Ballet School to come to our, her school in Missoula. Um, it was the time when, uh, directors actually went around and did kind of talent scouting for their um, for their schools. So he saw me when I was about 11 years old and asked me to move to San Francisco to study with him. And of course, my mother said, absolutely not. She yeah, must stay home. 11 years old? Are you kidding? <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> so she said, absolutely not. She has to finish high school and then you can have her. But so subsequently, what I did was I came down to San Francisco for the summer sessions every summer for six weeks and studied. And that is how I got my foothold into the San Francisco Ballet and then moved down. Actually, I finished school uh, a year early and moved down when I was 16 to join the school and then become an apprentice and then join the company. It's sort of like joining the circus. You know, you have to do it when you're very, very young. <laughs> this was kind of- So that's how I- No, go, go ahead. ahead. That was kind of a big adventure for a teenager to just pull up, even for six weeks in the summer, you knew you were going home, but you were gone and you're, here you are in this cozy town, Missoula, up in the mountains, and now you're in the big city in San Francisco. That must have been quite an adjustment for you. It was, but considering the choice, which was to either go to New York, because that was the other center of dance, um, uh, it was either New York or San Francisco. So San Francisco seemed much friendlier to me. And we always traveled down during the summers with another parent uh, uh, and my teacher. So, so it was very much chaperoned. Um, Tell me a little bit. So this was the San Francisco Ballet School. and. Is that, I assume that's associated with the San Francisco Ballet or, or are they separate entities or how does that work? No, they were, they are affiliated. They are the school of the company. And actually the school is, was actually housed in the same building as the company was. So that was a wonderful opportunity uh, when I was a youngster to be able to see the company dancers rehearsing. And also I was able to participate in some of the larger productions that required uh, student dancers like the Nutcracker or Cinderella or Swan Lake when they needed extra dancers. So that is, that is how young dancers get to um, learn the ropes and have the performance experience and then also be seen by the directors and the choreographers to, to see if they are interested in having you uh, be part of the company. So when I was 19, I was brought into the company and then started my dance career. Uh, I was there for about 17 years, uh, 10 years as a principal dancer. So made my way up the ranks and did a lot of wonderful touring all over the world, um, which was a a wonderful way to spend one's life actually, seeing all these beautiful theaters in Paris and South America and, and all over. What, uh, tell me about some of the ballets that you performed in. I know you uh, uh, were particularly uh, well-known, I should say, in, uh, in Romeo and Juliet, but you danced other roles too, didn't you? Yes, that was my signature role. In fact, I, that's why I was taken into the company uh, when I was young, was to be groomed for the role of Juliet. 
Um, but I also did, uh, I specialized in more dramatic lyrical roles, uh, story ballets, Hamlet and Ophelia, uh, La Sylphide, um, Giselle, the, the ones, I, I really enjoyed the roles that had um, a character development with them, uh, rather than just the abstract dance roles. Although I enjoyed those too, I, I also really enjoyed doing the Balanchine repertoire which is um, a, a very, uh, very specialized kind of movement, very, very quick, very, a lot of very fancy footwork, but also tell really- us, I'm sorry, tell us, tell some of our listeners who may not be familiar who George Balanchine was. George Balanchine was the founder of Dance in America, uh, of ballet. He was a Russian um, immigrant and he came in the uh, 50s, uh, er, uh, probably, yeah, early 50s, to start the New York City Ballet with Lincoln Kirstein. And it was the, um, actually it was not the first dance company in this, in this country. San Francisco Ballet was actually the first major dance company in this country. But George Balanchine was really the, um, the leader of dance in this country and developed a whole new way of movement, which, which um, was very uh, uh, concentrated on articulating uh, very qu quick footwork. And he had, so New York City Ballet is, is his company that he founded and it still exists today under different leadership, of course. Yeah. And then you danced all over the world. You mentioned Paris and <clears throat> probably a lot of prominent stages uh, around the world. Tell, tell us a few other uh, important cities where you danced. Well, um, when I first joined the company, it was a smaller group. There were only about 30 members in the group and we had our own orchestra and we did a lot of touring um, in not such remarkable places such as um, Lincoln, Nebraska, uh, uh, St. Louis, Kansas City. I know which is your, your birthplace, I believe. Um, and- <laughs> and close. Um, close, close enough, okay. And, and a lot of, we would do long bus tours around the Southwest and the Northwest and the Northeast. And that was a staple of our season. As the company got larger, uh, we did more um, major cities such as um, Washington DC, the Kennedy Center, uh, New York, uh, both what was called State Theater at that time, um, uh, City Center, uh, and, uh, and, you know, major cities, but then also going to the major European cities like, like Paris. We performed several times at the Garnier Opera House, which was a real treat. Um, uh, some places in Mexico City, uh, Colombia, Italy. And, and what was interesting about these places are uh, sometimes we would get into these theaters that were very, very old and beautiful, but the stages were actually raked. So this, which means that the, the, the level of the stage is not flat, it's actually on an angle. So that was a really um, interesting uh, adjustment of balance in order to figure out how you're going to stand up straight and, and jump up and land on your two feet. Um, on this slanted surface. Uh, so uh, growing up in the mountains might have been useful because you were used to inclined uh, surfaces and now you were dancing on an inclined uh, surface. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, eventually, right. eventually you, you concluded your dance. You spent 17 years, as you mentioned, uh, uh, with the ballet and um, I, I assume ballet dancers like, like sports figures have a, have a prime period where they can, where they can perform. And uh, you came to that point where you retired from actively uh, dancing. And tell us about how you, uh, how did you end up here? You were in San Francisco, you were dancing. You drew that part of your, your, your career to a close. And how did you end up up here on the uh, coast? What was, what was that transition? Well, my husband always loved the, uh, the coast and he always dreamed of living on the coast. Um, and so when one of the plans was that when I would retire, we would move up to the coast and we did live in Mendocino for a little while. 
um, then in Timber Cove. And finally, we came and, and during that those times, I was actually still actively teaching with the San Francisco mm -hmm. Ballet and running the trainee program. Um, I managed the trainee program, which is their pre-professional program. So going back and forth um, between uh, coastal homes and, and city. And uh, after about 10 years of that, that got to be a little bit um, tiresome. And I decided, okay, I will just take the plunge and move up to the coast full time. And that was the point where we purchased the building at 1000 Annapolis. My husband also loves to renovate properties. So this was a building, as many of, of you know in Sea Ranch, that was, uh, had been abandoned. It was a commercial building um, up by the airport, uh, the Sea Ranch Airport and up by Sea Ranch Supply that had been left to, um, moved out of abandoned for about seven years. And we purchased that building uh, you know, with the intent to renovate it and to bring it back to life and get tenants back there and bring, make, it, make it a real center of, a lively center for Sea Ranch. So we started doing that. And at that time I had just left my teaching career and I was sort of looking for something to do. We were trying to attract people to this, um, to this building. And so I thought, well, maybe we should open a wine shop there. Um, my husband had been in the wine shop for several years doing um, retail on the internet. And we had also always kind of pondered the idea of, of a bricks and mortars type store somewhere. And all of a sudden this beautiful space presented itself to us. And I thought, well, you know, we know the, the distributors, the importers, you know, we, we know the licensing of the wine business, you know, I think I'll just give this a try. And so I thought, well, you know, maybe I'll just pop up a wine shop in this space and see if it flies, see if the sea ranchers, you know, embrace it. And so I, I emailed Frank Bell, who was at the time the, uh, the community manager of Sea Ranch and suggested this idea. And he thought the sea ranchers will love it. So, and so what, what year was that when you, when you actually opened the doors to, uh, to the wine shop? You know, I keep saying it's three years ago, but I think it may be four years ago. Okay. <laughs> it was, it was, you know, the last year has seemed so lost. Uh, so I believe it was 2017 in the fall. And I did a couple of soft openings, just inviting everybody I knew. Um, and of course, it, it was quite popular. Uh, it was a really nice thing for place for sea ranchers to gather. Um, and, and then went, went forward, um, trying to figure out what my, um, what my place in, in a wine shop, in a retail wine shop would be on the coast. Um, I wanted to set myself apart. Um, uh, I didn't want to carry all the same wines as the markets, the surf market or, you know, um, any other markets. I wanted to, to uh, offer different things to the community of Sea Ranch. Um, I also want, didn't want to compete with, the, um, with some of the tasting rooms in the area. So I, I searched out um, wineries that didn't have tasting rooms. And so in, eventually after about a year, I figured out where my place was. And that was to bring in a really nice, um, carefully, uh, careful selection of international wines that were not available um, on the coast and also do a really a uh, nice selection of local and domestic wines. We're going to stop for a moment and remind our listeners or viewers on YouTube that you are listening or watching Peggy's Place. I'm George Callis, and our guest today is Wendy Van Dyke, who operates the wine shop at Annapolis Road. KGUA is on 88.3 FM. Uh, you can also listen to us worldwide if you go to kgua.org and click on the Airstream icon, or you can find us on the YouTube channel. Wendy, um, so you opened up and your approach was to source wines that, uh, tell me if this is correct, that you thought were maybe undiscovered or unknown uh, to people. And, and I also might add, your shop is not open just to sea ranchers. It's open to the, it's open to the general public. Any, anyone can come and shop uh, at the wine shop, correct? 
That's right, absolutely. And, and there are a lot of tourists that come by. And, um, and that was why I thought it was important not only to bring in these interesting imported wines, but to, to make sure that I offered wines from the region. Um, I went through the Anderson Valley to see, um, to find the perfect Pinot that I wanted to, to offer in my shop. And uh, we have uh, wines from Wild Hog, which is just up uh, east of the Timber Cove Inn. They're a local, local wines, uh, but also from Napa and Sonoma. So, so a, really, uh, a really good balance of, of wines for the people, for visitors that are coming up and renting homes in the Sea Ranch or just passing through. Um, some, if they want to pick up a picnic wine to take to the beach. Um, and, and so I, uh, I also wanted to, um, to in, by introducing some of these unusual wines to the community, I thought, well, how am I going to get people to know them? So after about six months, I thought, well, I think I better start um, introducing some wine tasting events. And I began uh, on Saturdays uh, having three different wines, perhaps, you know, a, a white from France, a white from Italy, and a white from Greece, um, or three different Pinots from the region. So I started introducing people to the wines that I carry, and that was a really great educational tool. Um, people got, uh, found what their favorites were, and then they continued ordering those. So, so there, thereby I was able to establish a really nice repertoire of wines, Originally, um, for the, uh, when you first opened, though, you you had uh, you were open several days a week, isn't that correct? Or were, were you open Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays? Uh, yes, for, in the, for quite a while. Yes, yes, yes. At first, Saturdays and Sundays, but then uh, then Sundays didn't seem to to be very popular. Um, people were sleeping in, <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I then so then I switched to Fridays and Saturdays, and that was pretty good too but Saturdays was always the main day and um and so so when COVID hit of course um I decided to confine the um the the schedule to just Saturdays and and where it was a very um interesting transition because we had been it was the wine shop had been a really lively place for social gatherings and to come and sip a glass of wine and all of a sudden that was becoming too dangerous and I had to shut that down. And so I was trying to figure out, you know, how do I keep going? And um, luckily I have a, a customer list of about 350 people now who, um, who I would send out when I was doing the wine tastings, I would send out an invitation for the wine tastings telling what we were going to be serving that Saturday. So I just shifted gears a little bit and I decided to uh, go into just the curbside pickups. Um, I had, I put my whole inventory list um, on an email on Thursdays, sent it out and uh, folks would start emailing, emailing me their orders or calling me with their orders. I would pack them up and I would put them out on the porch for them to pick out. So that's how we had to pivot um, in the spring of 2020. And that proved, that proved to be a pretty workable uh, solution in the end for you, did, didn't it? Sure, you lost the social, a lot of the social aspect because people couldn't uh, congregate in your shop. But in terms of, of selling wine, uh, the curbside pickup uh, that you, your solution, did that work out pretty well? Yes, in fact, it did. It worked out very well. And um, I mean, it was at a time when folks, a lot of folks um, who had second homes in the Sea Ranch were spending more time in Sea Ranch because they wanted to get out of the city. And at the same time, they couldn't go out to eat. Uh, they couldn't go over to friends for drinks. So they were buying more wine just to have at home. And so that really, um, it really kept me going through the pandemic. Um, and yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so, you, <laughs> so you experienced some of the same things. You know, I think a lot of us have read articles that during the entire pandemic, uh, uh, wine consumption and alcohol consumption in general in homes, because we were all stuck at home, uh, increased across America. So you experienced uh, a similar 
increased just in your shop alone. That's right. Absolutely. I would say, you know, probably a 30% increase in sales. Um, and, and I think that has leveled off a little bit in the, in the last few months as people were, are, are able to start getting out a bit. Um, and, and the fun thing was that even though we lost the social aspect of it, we would, I would always pop outside when I saw somebody picking up their wine and say hello. You know, we could gather outside. It was safe to do that. And so, so in that way, we, I still was able to keep connected with a lot of the folks in my store, which um, was important to me. Right. So currently, uh, how, do you operate, how do you operate your shop now? Can, I, can people come in? Is the curbside still available or what limitations do you still have to operate today? Yes, well, uh, the curbside seems to still be um, an option that people really like. So I, I keep sending out my Thursday email list um, with, the, with the inventory on it. And people, you know, uh, not as many people do that, but some people really enjoy doing that. And people who are more careful prefer to just operate that way, which is fine. I do invite people into the shop. Of course, everybody has to remain masked and we try to be social distant, but, but things are, are a little bit more um, uh, relaxed and social. We are not able to do the wine tasting yet. Um, but I am looking forward to perhaps uh, when we do come to the other side of this COVID situation of, of reinventing the wine shop and doing uh, perhaps wines by the glass mm -hmm. um, or flights of wine to, to, re to, to, to come back to a social um, aspect that is so important, I think. Wendy, for our listeners and viewers who aren't familiar with your list that you send out every week, how could they how can they contact you and get on your email wish on your email list should they wish to? I have a, a great um, email. It's one thousand annapolis at gmail.com. That's one zero 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 annapolis at gmail.com. And you may just contact to contact me and ask to be put on my list. And then every Thursday you will get my email. And I, in, in addition to the inventory that I, I send, I also highlight a few different wines or some, something new or something that has been in my inventory and we've all forgotten about. <laughs> um, so, so, uh, and so, so I think it's interesting reading too, at least I hope it is. <laughs> right, and, and people don't get inundated with emails. They get one email a week from you and yes. they, they can look at it and see what you've got and decide if they need to purchase anything. That's right. That's right. And oftentimes, you know, I, I am a small wine shop. I have about 80 different wines, but I don't have lots and lots of inventory of each wine. So people have gotten to know that if I get a wine in, they better uh, put their order in because it may be gone in two days. <laughs> so, all right, I've, so I'm. I've heard of that. I've heard of that happening, and you had a couple of great sellers that were. My personal experience: I got there, and you were out of them by the time I arrived. So it, it's good to put in your order early if you see something you like. That's but right. you'll, but you restock those those really good items that that sell well. You restock them so they're not gone forever. Yes. Yes, I do. Except there are exceptions of wines that just sell out, and even the importer has no more wines. And and one 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 problem with the with the pandemic is the supply chains have become have really gotten slogged down, and things are not arriving as quickly as you know. A lot of the French wines took a few extra months to arrive, and then only a certain amount, certain few cases came in. So I get my allocation and then, and that, that, that may be it for the year. So, um, and also with the fires, um, you know, vintners are not necessarily producing as much wine as they used to. So, so there are, there definitely are limitations. Yeah. yeah. Well, Wendy, you've uh, brought a few wines to uh, from your shop to show us that, that we'd like to talk about. And, um, um, one, I think, have you got a bottle handy there? I there do. we go. There we go. Now, uh, we're not going to, for our listeners, uh, it's a little early in the morning. We're not going to be doing any tastings here. Uh, well, Wendy, you can. You've got the bottle right in front of you. 
but uh, we're going to instead show you a little bit and Wendy's going to tell us about each wine and maybe why it's special or why she carries it in her shop. What's this first one you've got, Wendy? So the first one I have is a rosé, which is wonderful for this time of year, even with this gloom and doom that we're experiencing on the coast right now. Um, it's, it's a nice bottle of wine to have in the afternoon, to have as a picnic wine. This is from um, Sep, which is uh, the second label of Pay Vineyard. And, and that's a very local wine for us. The, the, uh, the winery is right up on Annapolis Road, uh, about 20 minutes up the road from the wine shop. And uh, this, this wine is made from Pinot grapes. And the grapes actually of this wine are from Russian River Valley. So it's not from from grapes that are right up the road, but the winery is up the road. And it's a beautiful spot to visit, actually, if any of you want to have a little foray up into the vineyards. Um, but this is a really light, dry, delicate afternoon wine. Um, also screw cap. So it's perfect to take to the beach or for a picnic. Because um, you don't, so you don't is... need to have a corkscrew with you to do that. Wendy, no. isn't, isn't this particular rosé a little bit lower on the alcohol content than, than a lot of wines? Yeah. Can, you, can you talk about yeah. that a bit? And I was just looking at, this is 12%, which is quite low for a, a, a wine. Um, and, and what's wonderful about that, you can drink a glass or two in the afternoon and it would, won't put you out for the rest of the day. Um, you can still function and have a really nice afternoon. Um, and, and, you know, especially if you have it with a salad or a, a sandwich or something, then, then you're going to, it's just going to, uh, be, be a really nice, um, kind of a subtle, subtle way to enjoy your afternoon rather than feeling like you need to go take a nap. <laughs> right. And with this rosé, will I serve that chilled? Should that, should that go in the refrigerator before I, before I yes. open it up? Absolutely. Yes. That and so chilled. And yeah, and second question, in your shop, wines that should be chilled, do you, do you have chilled wines available? So if someone's here from out of town and maybe they don't have access to a refrigerator, can you sell them a cold bottle of wine? I certainly can. I can sell them a cold bottle of wine or champagne or, yes, most of the wines um, that, that can be served, that should be served chilled, I will have a bottle or two tucked away in the refrigerator. So, so they are ready to go. Fantastic. Yeah. Fantastic. Talk a little, uh, expand just a little bit. You mentioned that the winery, the Pay Winery, who makes this uh, rosé. Would you hold that label up so uh, our viewers can see it really well? There we go. And this is Sep, which is the second wine, so-called second label from Pay. But you mentioned that Pay uh, is, is up the road on Annapolis Road, uh, further up. But the grapes are actually from uh, a vineyard in the Russian River Valley. And explain a little bit how that works for uh, for people who aren't familiar. Why why don't they just grow the grapes next you know next door to the winery, or, or uh, why is it the winery down in the Russian River? Explain how that's pretty common in the wine business. Yes, yes. Um, I mean, there are only a certain amount of, of grapes that they can get from their estate vineyards, mm -hmm. and the estate uh, grapes usually go for their higher end wines and pays pinots and chardonnays are, are a higher price point and but they do still want so they save their estate uh grapes for those particular wines so that but they still like to uh, to produce some more value oriented wines so they will go to other vineyards and source grapes from those vineyards so you might so this is hopkins ranch so you might uh -huh. see several different producers actually um, using grapes from the Hopkins Ranch um, or the Jewel Ranch or, um, you know, different, different vineyards in, in the area. But, um, and, and, and thereby, this is, this is from the Russian River Valley. So that's still the Sonoma Coast Appalachian. Um, and, uh, but, but they are able to offer this at a slightly um, lower price point. So, so that's what's nice about that. Yeah. Right. And you've, you've actively sought uh, you have both some of the so-called flagship wines, but you've got some of the more value-priced wines. So you've got a nice, nice spread in terms of pricing and, and things for your customers. 
That's that's right. I like to offer a really nice. I mean, I think you shouldn't have to break the bank to have a really nice bottle of wine. And uh, but but you do still need to have that really nice bottle if it's a special occasion. So I really try to offer a wide range. But but even in the, the wines that are value oriented, I, I taste every wine and I make sure that I like the wine because if I don't like it, I can't sell it. So <laughs> it <laughs> so so each each of these wines are tried and tasted by me. Um, and that's why it's a small inventory. That's why I don't have a thousand different wines. Um, so, uh, yeah. Wonderful. Um, so that's the Sep uh, Rosé. Uh, and it's yes. made from Pinot Noir grapes with Russian River Valley, grapes from the Russian River Valley. And it's a handy screw cap, which makes it a great picnic or beach wine. What else have you got? To, what other wines are we going to look at today? Okay, so I have another white, um, and this time we're going over to France. Uh, I love the French wines. Um, and this is a Sancerre from the Loire Valley. Uh, this is Jean-Max Roger. So um, Jean-Max Roger is a small producer um, out of the Sancerre Appalachian, imported by a New York importer. Um, it's 100% Sauvignon Blanc uh, grapes. It's grown in... Um, kind of stony limestone um, vineyards, which gives it um, this kind of a dry, dry, stony, flinty kind of flavor. Um, this is uh, this one has a little bit more weight than than the the rosé, I would say, um, but a wonderful uh, summer wine as well. Uh, it could be a summer or a winter wine, but. A, but I, what, what I love to do with this wine actually is to get a nice chunk of the Cypress Grove Humboldt, uh, um, the blue cheese, the local blue cheese from Cypress, Cypress Fog, Humboldt, whatever it's called. Um, <laughs> Humboldt Fog. Humboldt yeah, Fog. Cypress Humboldt Fog, fog. Yeah. yeah. Yes, yeah. the one with the little blue vein, the little blue That's ash. It. So something like that. Uh, at the end of the day, a nice chilled glass of the Sancerre with a little bit of, of, of goat cheese is just a wonderful com uh, combination, a really nice way to, to start your evening or your late afternoon. Um, this one also would go really nicely with oysters or any kind of seafood that, that you might like. Um, and, it's, and one thing about Sauvignon Blanc, sometimes they tend to be a quite herbaceous and grassy, and this one is not. I looked far and wide for the perfect Sancerre, tasted many of them, and, and came upon this one, and I'm lucky that it has been really consistent through the vintages as well. So this is, this is, this is a keeper in my shop. <laughs> so the Sauvignon Blancs from France, which uh, all Sancerres are made from Sauvignon Blanc, but they're different. We, we, have, we grow Sauvignon Blanc here in California. They grow Sauvignon Blanc in New Zealand. And so there's, there's different, even though it's the same grape, uh, the same varietal, uh, they taste different. They have different flavor profiles. Yes, and, and some of that has to do with the weather. Some of it has to do with the, um, the kind of soil and the earth that it's growing in. Some of it has to do with the winemaker themselves. Um, I think if you, if you have a Sauvignon Blanc from Sonoma, um, it's going to be, or Napa, it's gonna be probably a little heavier and a little richer um, because, of, because of the heat. Um, uh, so, so, and, and, uh, and sometimes winemakers will also put a little, a little bit of something else in their Sauvignon Blanc. Um, uh -huh. I have one from Napa that has a little semillon in it. You know, just ten percent semillon. That was that was the winemaker's um, uh, uh, just uh, way to make kind of put his put his stamp on it, so to speak. Uh -huh. um, so so they are very different. Um, but once you try a Sancerre from France, uh, I think. You you will always go back to a sensor from friends. <laughs> At least we'll I be, do. We'll be hooked, is what you're saying we'll, on, on that on that yes. particular one. Yeah, and you mentioned yeah. here another idea that uh, some winemakers will add will add uh, uh, grape will add juice from a different type of grape. In other words, they're doing blending 
talk a little bit about that. Uh, and here in California, uh, we don't think about wines blended from different grapes a whole lot. But in France, it's extremely common to do that. Talk a little bit about blending of wines. Yes, yes. So um, you find that especially in uh, Bordeaux, mm -hmm. where uh, the, the wines, the Cabernets and their Merlots will always be a blend of, you know, at least two, three, four grapes. Whereas here in this country, if you get a California Cab, it's usually, it's usually just Cab. I think it has to be 75% Cabernet in order to be called a Cabernet. But you, you do find more often um, just a Merlot. I have a frog's leap Merlot, which is 100% Merlot in my shop. And I have many cabs that are 100% are Cabernet. But in France, for a Bordeaux, Bordeaux, you will find, you know, on the left bank, it's primarily Cabernet, then a little less Merlot, some Cab Franc. Um, and, and on the right bank, primarily Merlot, but then with a few other um, uh, grapes put in. So it's always a blend. It's called the Bordeaux blend. And some of um, some wineries in this country have have started taking that idea, um, like Chapelet, which is um, the mountain cuvee that I have in my shop, is a Bordeaux blend. And that has about five diff the different Bordeaux uh, uh, great varieties in it. So, so in fr the, the French and the California vintners are always talking to each other and, and learning from each other, which is a really nice, a nice um, thing and, and coming over and actually uh, starting partnerships with each other. So there's a lot of cross cultivation there of ideas um, of, of wines and winemaking, but the blending is, is really um, the, the magic of the vintner that's putting his, his stamp on it rather than just letting the grape variety speak for itself. Speaking of magic, uh, we're being brought to you by the magic of radio waves, the internet and YouTube, and you're watching Peggy's Place, watching or listening Peggy's Place. Uh, and our guest today is Wendy Van Dyke uh, from the wine shop at 1000 Nap Annapolis Road. We're KGUA at 88.3 FM in Wallala not too far from the wine shop. Wendy, what's the next uh, wine uh, that you've brought to show us and tell us about? So I have one more white and then we'll move on to the reds, but I wanted to show this um, Gruner Weltliner from Austria. Uh, the producer is Jonas Hirsch, not to be confused with Hirsch Vineyard here on the coast, um, but Jonas Hirsch, Hirsch is a really young up and coming, probably the star, of a uh, winemaker of Austria right now. And he produces a Gruner Weltliner and a Riesling, both white wines um, from, the, from the region. And this is a, um, a wine that's very different from a Chardonnay or Sauvignon Blanc, um, but it's still very um, friendly, easy, food friendly, um, kind of a sunny wine, I would say, but it's still got some good weight and richness um, a little bit of lemon, but a dry finish. And this one also has the screw cap, which is very handy. But this one I wanted to bring to your attention because it's um, a great wine for Asian food. So for instance, if you're picking up some food at the Thai kitchen in Anchor Bay, this would be a wonderful wine to have in the fridge. Um, or if you're having sushi, sashimi, um, any kind of curry, uh, tarragon chicken, that type of food, even asparagus, foods that are difficult to pair wines with, vegetables, salads, this, a Gruner Weltliner would be a wonderful option for that. Absolutely. And the Rieslings are also pair very nicely with, with Asian cuisine, don't, don't they? Yes. yes, yes, a little bit thicker and richer, um, a little more body. This, this is a little lighter and, and crisper. Um, but, but both, yes, both really nice with that kind of cuisine. Fantastic. So that. Why don't we, uh, show us your red. We're, we've got about 10 or 12 minutes here. So let's yes. talk about your, let's move to some of the reds and tell our, uh, tell our listeners yeah. about, about those. What's the next one? So I have three reds and they're all really fun reds. I chose them because they're, they're not, they're not terribly serious, but they're really easy drinking fun reds. We have a Malbec from Argentina, 
the La Flor, which is part of the Paul Hobbs selection. And this is a really round um, kind of red currant, um, silky wine, great with a burger. Um, this, is, this is the burger wine, also screw cap. So it's, it's young and, and fresh, meant to be, um, meant to be drunk young. Um, Paul Hobbs, who is a very famous vintner here in California, um, went down to Arch to South America to Argentina to learn about what they were doing in the vineyards down there and established this relationship with this particular winery. So then became the importer. And this is something that um, that a lot of vintners do. You know, they spend time in South America to, or Australia when they're in their formative years learning about wine. A lot of them go to France, of course. Um, in fact, the, the pay, um, the, the set pay uh, winemaker, Vanessa Wong, spent quite a bit of time in Bordeaux at the, the Rothschild winery. So, so it's very common. Uh -huh. So, but this is, what, this is the result of, of his affiliation with that, um, with that winery. So we have that one. And then I know we're, we're a little, uh, we don't have much time, so I'm gonna just move on. We also have this one called the Lee Valley Susumaniello from Puglia in Italy. So it's the heel of the boot of Italy down by the Mediterranean. This one is um, uh, a real fat kind of soft fat wine with lots of berries, lots of character. Um, it's the Susumaniello aside from just being really fun to say, because it rolls off your tongue, Susu um, is is an indigenous grape variety thought originally to come from Greece, which is right across this, the, the sea there. Um, so hence it has this little um, Greek uh, drawing um, on the side of it. But this is a great wine, I think for pizza, uh, pizza, mm. pasta, you know, just just a fun wine when you're when you're gathering with with a bunch of friends. Um, again, not too serious, but really flavorful. This uh, uh, and, that particularly the uh, Susa Maniello, uh strikes me as a good example of what you were saying earlier that you've tried to seek out things that uh, most of us here in California are completely unfamiliar with, but you found something interesting and and the story that the Susa Maniello a uh, grape is indigenous to Italy. It might have come from Greece. We don't know, but it's indigenous. And if I understand correctly, the, the winemaker sort of revived this grape. It was nearly nearly gone or wasn't produced anywhere. And he sort of brought it back uh, and then and then grew it in, in Puglia, which we don't think of as one of the big winemaking uh, areas from Italy, although they make wine everywhere, everywhere in Italy. So this is a good example of something uh, unusual that most wine drinkers will have never had or will won't know anything about. That's right. And this winery also makes a delicious white. It's called the Verdeca grape, also a varietal that was almost lost that they are reviving. And this year I had in my shop for the first time um, a rosé of the Susumaniello grape, which was delicious and flew off the shelves and and is no longer available until next year, but we'll have to look forward to it next summer. Yeah. yeah. So your earlier comment was, if you see something you're interested in, buy it today because it may be gone for another year, right? Wonderful. Right, that's right. And what's, uh, what's the last red that you want to show the us? The last one is a Syrah from Morocco. Now this is also one of those really fun discoveries from from one of my favorite salesmen who, who, who luckily just sends me these wonderful, wonderful, unusual wines. Now, um, Wendy, Wendy, Morocco is in North Africa. That's right, that's right. Uh, they, don't, they don't make any wine in North Africa, do they, or do they? They do, and this, this is, has a wonderful story behind it. I don't know if our viewers can see, but there's a picture of two bicyclists or two people on a tandem bicycle on the, the label. And it's called a Sirocco because it's a Syrah from Morocco. So the story behind this, this is made by, um, by Alain Greyo, who's a, a legendary vintner in the Northern Rhone. 
Uh, he produces um, both Saint Joseph, Croze Hermitage wine, Syrah wines in the Rhone. And he was on holiday once in Morocco near Casablanca on his bicycle with his son riding through the hillsides and came across this vineyard uh, site um, which he and he stopped and he thought this is a beautiful vineyard site of course he's looking at uh, the elevation he's looking at where the where the vines are facing you know how much rain how much sunlight they might be getting and he thought this would be a fabulous um, place to grow Syrah. So he approached the, uh, the owners of the, of the vineyards and said, may I, may I plant some Syrah and make some Syrah from this vineyard? And they said, yes. And so this is his effort from Morocco, a Syrah from Morocco. And it's, um, you know, it's, it's of the three, it's the richest and most powerful of, of the wines. It's really uh, quite peppery. Uh, I find it really peppery on the sides of my tongue. So that's kind of the, the distinct um, uh, flavor that I find very earthy. And this one would go really nicely with um, some darker meats, um, some, some lamb or, you know, like a, a something spicy, like a five spice pork or something like that. Um, so that's, that's a really great seller in my store. I can't keep enough of this in stock. Fantastic. Fantastic. Well, let's see, you've got the wines, you've got your six wines that you're showing us all lined up today. Let's reiterate those for our listeners. Uh, start, start with the, uh, the Sep Rosé and tell us, so we're going, we're going from lighter wines to fuller bodied wines. That's right. So we have the Sep Rosé from Pinot Noir from the Russian River Valley. Great mm -hmm. for your picnic. And then we go to the Sancerre, Sancerre, which is a Sauvignon Blanc from the Loire Valley, a little richer and flintier, but also wonderful with a wedge of cheese or um, some seafood. And then we have the Hirsch Gruner Veltliner from Austria, um, great with Asian food, Thai food. Also it's companion Riesling is nice too. Uh, then we have the La Flor uh, Malbec from Argentina, uh, imported by Paul Hobbs. Uh, the, the Burger Wine, as I call it. Uh, the Susu Maniello from Puglia, Italy. Uh, that's the real lively. I, I actually I like to say that's like a party in your mouth because it's just <laughs> there's just so many flavors in your mouth. It's it's kind of hard to pinpoint them all, but it's just it's really lively. And then finally, um, the Sirocco. The uh, this one from Morocco. So we've got. Let me. We've got. You've got a wine from California. You got a wine from Austria. You have one from uh, Argentina, obviously from France, and then one that's grown in Morocco. Oh, and and Italy. Did I say Italy? It so mm -hmm. yeah. today, you, today you shared six different countries, in, including our own country. And uh, uh, and that's just a small selection out of your shop that uh, that you thought were good. Let's talk. Uh, you mentioned this a little bit earlier, and this we'll, we'll probably wrap up with this. But let's talk. You made reference to uh, to uh, wine tastings and selling wines uh, by the glass. Talk a little bit about what your intention or hope is. You're you're not doing that currently because with the pandemic restrictions, it's, it's not feasible. But tell us what you're uh, intending or hoping to do. Yes, I'm hoping uh, when we come out of the pandemic, when it's all safe and we're comfortable to do so, to offer perhaps um, uh, weekly wines, uh, for instance, maybe two or three whites and two or three reds on a Saturday afternoon that you could purchase by the glass uh, and, and enjoy them at the wine shop um, or uh, what we call flights of wine. So you would get um, you know, three smaller glasses of, of three different uh, samples of wines. And I think they're each you know, maybe three ounces, but it would, it would be um, the equivalent of one glass of wine, but you would get to taste, for instance, three different Pinots or um, three different whites, you know, perhaps, perhaps, or a rosé, 
or perhaps a rosé and a white and a red from the same producer. So each, each weekend I would come up with some, um, some plans to, to, um, to offer. And, and that, would, that would be on a Saturday afternoon. Uh, you can uh, peruse the, uh, the wine shop and the adjacent gallery. We have the Linden Design Gallery next door. So you could wander in with your glass of wine um, and, and enjoy that. Um, as, as, and hopefully at that, you know, at, at that point, perhaps we could even be open on a Friday and a Saturday. And that right. will happen. We'll see how that so goes. The, yeah. So the wines by the glass or the flights would give your uh, customers a chance to uh, taste a wine before they purchase a whole bottle. I, I mean, you will have selected what wines are available for taste each yeah. weekend, but it lets you uh, it lets you try out a wine and see if you enjoy it and then purchase purchase a bottle or more uh, if you do. Now, does this exactly. require, um, it, does that mean you're a bar uh, or how does that work? You're, uh, you know, it, you're, you're not just to pick up wine off the shelf now and, and, and take it home, you're actually pouring it in the shop. Are there some legal differences yeah. that you have to yeah. Uh, yeah. handle? Uh, well, well, luckily the license that I have permits me, to, it, uh, I have a bar slash tavern license. So I am permitted to do that uh, within the wine shop. So um, that is why I was able to do the wine tasting in the past. And, um, but I would, I think the idea of expanding it to wines by the glass is a really nice way to um, bring the community together even more. Um, so that, that's, that's what I hope to do, yes. Fantastic. Well, we're gonna need to wrap it up here, but I wanna remind everybody, we've been visiting with Wendy Van Dyke, the owner and proprietor of uh, the wine shop. Here we go, we got a nice picture of the wine shop at 1000 Annapolis Road. Currently, Wendy is open on Saturday afternoons from 11 to five. You, you can uh, either contact her for curbside pickup, or you can come in if you're properly masked uh, uh, to the shop. And uh, Wendy, it's just been wonderful having you uh, here with us and sharing those six uh, wines that you carry. And uh, we probably should remind everyone that you need to be 21 to purchase alcoholic uh, beverages in California across the United States. And uh, Wendy, I'm sure I'm speaking for you when I say Enjoy your wine, but enjoy it responsibly. That's right. Thank you very much, George. It's been wonderful to be on your program with you. And I'll see you all at the wine shop. Everybody come down on Saturday and buy a bottle of wine from Wendy. Thanks so much, Wendy. Leanne and I, will. Yes, and I want to thank you both so much for the great show on wine today. Uh, my family has 22 acres of Cabernet grapes up in Mendocino County. And we sell in bulk to some of the bigger wineries like Kendall Jackson and Chandon. Uh, but I have heard so much about different wineries in the local Mendocino County, Sonoma counties. And you talked about varietals. There's one called Coro Mendocino, which is a really delicious Zinfandel uh, blend. And you can look them up online. But anyway, George Callis, I want to thank you so much for hosting today's show. He is the editor of the Sea Ranch Soundings Magazines and publisher at White Barn Press and Wendy Van Dyke of the Wine Shop in the Sea Ranch at 1000 Annapolis Road. Thank you both so much for being on the show today. Thank you. All right. Thank you. I'm going to say <laughs> goodbye to them and goodbye to everybody on YouTube. This is KGUA in Wallala 88.3 FM. We are streaming around the globe at kgua.org. Just click on the Air Pocket app. And we're also on Radio Garden and 